Good morning. Praise the Lord. Good morning. In my friendliest morning, please have a sea voice. Good morning. So good to see everyone this morning. Hope everyone enjoyed our, our brief reprieve from our winter weather this weekend. Got out and enjoyed some Black Friday or some just beautiful weather, whatever you were out doing. Um, as I was driving in this morning, uh, one of the songs that we sing was on the CD, and it struck me as odd for the very first time, and it was that song, um, Shekinah Glory. And it says, we're waiting for you to walk in. Walk in the room. And clear as a bell, the Lord said, I have, I have, I have walked in the room, I have walked in the room, I have walked in the room. Every time you walk in a room, he has walked in the room. And the scripture came to me, um, what Jesus said, Jesus told his disciples, verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, which means he's repeating himself, which means listen up. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Jesus said this to his disciples. Well, he he still had to walk in the room. He still had to walk in the room and physically be present with them. But he was speaking of a time when everywhere we go, there's two of me, yes. right? He has agreed with me. He has agreed with me in perfection for yes. eternity. Yes. Everywhere I go, there are two agreeing yes. on his word. Yes. And when we gather, no matter how many or how few in this place, I've, oh, it's like, Lord, the revelation that comes from the word here, the grace, the revelation of grace, the understanding of who we are, how is it? That as a small group of believers, how is your presence so powerful? How is it? Because you know who you are. And you know who I am. It takes one of us to fill a room with his glory. We don't have to sing for him to walk in the room, for his Shekinah glory to come. His Shekinah glory is everywhere we are. It is who we are. And so I had this vision of this great dam You guys have all seen a picture or a movie somewhere. All it takes is one little trickle, one drip, and there's a whole lot of pressure building up behind that dam. There's a whole lot of water, that living water building up behind that dam. The pressure's building. It takes one little leak, one person to step out in faith, to start speaking the word, spreading that water, that living water, the word of truth, and pretty soon another trickle, and pop, 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 that dam comes tumbling down, and the glory of God fills the earth yes. as clear as, the, as my hand before my face. We cannot, things are not as they appear. I say that all the time. Things are not as they appear. You speak. You be the trickle here, the trickle there, the trickle there, and pretty soon the glory of God will be loosed in a way yes. that this world has yes. never yes. known. Yes. You know, the pressure cooker, right? The pressure cooker, ch- 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 if that, if one little tiny thing on that thing, that whole thing explodes, and my mom had me terrified. I used a pressure cooker all the time, and she had me terrified. You listen, because that'll blow. That's a ticking time bomb in your kitchen. Make sure it's set right. Make sure the seals are right before you turn that thing on. We have the power of resurrection life, of eternal life. What we say has eternal consequences for ourselves and for those around us, but we can't hold it in. When we hold it in, we dam ourselves up. We dam up that flow. It's for others. It's to give. It's to bless. We are blessed to be a blessing. So I encourage you, trickle. Speak it. Speak that word and just know that you are breaking that dam. You are breaking that dam one at a time. And pretty soon we will all see the glory of God as never before in Jesus' name. Anybody have any prayer requests or testimonies this morning? Well, praise the Lord. Yeah, Roberto. <laughs>
let's stand and go before the Lord this morning. Yes. Heavenly Father, we just come before you today, Lord, to agree together, Lord. We pray for Roberto's sister, Lord, in that situation. We thank you, Lord, that when we come together and agree, Lord, when we agree with your word, Lord, it is finished. It is done, Lord. The blind eyes would be open, Lord, and the deaf ears would hear, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are preparing to release your glory in a way as never before, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that all of your authority, all of your power rests in the heart of man, Lord. Give us wisdom and revelation, Lord, to walk in your ways, Lord, to speak your word, a seed planted in due season, Lord, and that those that come after, Lord, would water, Lord, and that you bring the increase, Lord. Jesus, we come together this morning to lift you up and to praise you. And thank you, Lord. We enter your courts with praise, Lord. Enter through the gates with thanksgiving, Lord. Jesus. Jesus, have your way this morning. So we lift our voice in praise to you. So we seek after you, Lord. Lord, as we come boldly into your presence, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that it is finished. Thank you, Lord, that our enemy is defeated, Lord, that you have taken the keys to death, hell, and the grave. What shall we fear? What can come against us? Oh, Lord, but we look to you. We look to you, Lord. Let the spirit within us rise up to speak words of truth to speak words of freedom, to speak words of liberty and peace and joy and love in the Holy Ghost. Lord, we will walk in the fullness of our inheritance right now. We will walk boldly as you walked this earth, Lord, speaking to those things that are not as though they are, Lord, expecting, knowing that it is finished, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the revelation of your grace, of the finished work of the cross. And I thank you for the rest, the rest that comes from knowing that we simply need to trust in you, to believe and to trust in you, Lord, and that all we have to do is agree with your word, to agree with your word, to speak it forth as you did. So simple, so simple, Lord, but the battle rages for our belief, Lord, Forgive us our unbelief and help us to see with eyes of the Spirit and to hear with the ears of the Spirit as you lead and as you guide, Lord. And I ask that you continue to open the hidden things in your word for now, for this time, for this body, Lord. And I ask that you be, a, be with us, Lord, as you set your hedge of protection around us and around our loved ones, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you go before us and you make the way, Lord. And you watch over us, behind us, and protect us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I believe that we are um, taken care of through Christmas. So um, if anybody wants to sign up for uh, the end of December and into January, that would be wonderful. Uh, we will be doing Eastern Gate House of Prayer the first Friday of the month in December. Uh, that's this Friday. Wow. Whew wasn't ready for that, um, this Friday, uh, December 5th, and we are going to do our, um, well, it's our, I guess our Christmas feast together. We're going to do a soup uh, dinner, so there's a sign-up sheet in the back to bring soup or sides or whatever you'd like to bring. <laughs> I'll RSVP, I'll just sign up. <laughs> All right. Let's speak the word this morning. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. 
Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Lord. Um, let's see, Toby and uh, John, you two want to come take the offering this morning, please? Toby, would you please ask him? James. Hallelujah. I sense that the stuffing has settled. <laughs> I think it's time to start getting rid of some of it right now <laughs> before it starts fermenting. I have a thank you song I'm going to start out with. It's not a traditional thank you song, but that's okay. I'm not traditional anyway. <laughs> by the devil, born already ruined, stone cold dead as I stepped out of the womb, by his grace I've been touched, by his word I've been healed, by his hand I've been delivered, by his fair life I've been sealed, I've been saved, by the blood of the Lamb, we're saved. upright in his strength I do endure by his power I've been lifted in his love I am secure he brought me with a price freed me from the pit full of emptiness and wrath and the fire burns within I'm saved y'all saved by the blood of the Lamb yes I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb yes I'm so glad I'm so glad. 
and what he's done for me. When I think of his goodness and how he set me free, I want to praise, 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 praise all night, all night. When I think of his goodness and what he's done for me. When I think of his goodness and how he set me free, I want to sing, 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 sing all night, all night. When I think of his goodness and what he's done for me. When I think of his goodness and how he set me free, I want to shout, 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 shout all night, all night. When I think of his goodness and what he's done for me. When I think of his goodness and how he set me free, I want to dance, 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 dance all night. When I think of his goodness and how he set me free, I want to praise, 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 praise all night, all night. When I think of his goodness and what he's done for me, when I think of his goodness and how he set me free, I want to dance, 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 dance all night, Let's dance. all night. And what he's done for me When I think of his goodness And how he set me free I want to praise, 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 some words a couple weeks ago and I can't shake them. They're talking about the light, the Holy Spirit, the kingdom that is within you. We need to open up the door and let it out. There's a dying world coming into this Christmas season. There are going to be a lot of people just giving up because they have no hope. 
He is the hope. He has placed that hope within us, and we need to release it out to this world that is dying. Even those within the church that walk through the religious times, just go through tradition, don't understand the relationship that we have with our Lord Jesus and the kingdom that has been placed within us. It's time to release this. I'm gonna, this song has been burning on my heart ever since Pastor spoke those words. Just join with us. Time comes, days go by, earthquakes and buildings falling from the sky, and yet a new day breaks, and still another reason why to live. We are, we are the generation, come on church, we are the generation. Stand and find in the midst of all the darkness, we'll carry the light. We are the generation who will stand and fight in the midst of all the darkness. We'll carry the light. We'll carry the Fathers fail and children hide. Hearts are broken from the hurt they have inside. And yet a new day breaks. There's still another reason why to live. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We are the generation. Who will stand and fight in the midst of all the darkness? We carry the light. We are the generation who will stand and fight in the midst of all the darkness. We carry the light. the power of God's own hand and it's a new day and now it's time for the saints to shine that you and me church that you and me church let us shine we are the generation who will stand and fight in the midst of all the darkness who can carry the light Who will stand and fight in the midst of all the darkness? Who can carry the light? Carry the light inside. Who carry the light inside? You are the light of the world. You are the In the midst of all the darkness, we'll carry the light. We are, we are the generation who will stand and fight. In the midst of all the darkness, we'll carry the light. We'll carry the light, Lord. Carry your light, Lord. 
Carry your light, Lord. Carry your light, Lord. Burn, Lord. Burn, burn, Lord. Glory to your name, God. Whoa. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy, worthy, worthy. It's all about you, Lord. It's all about you, Lord. It's all about you, Lord. It's all about you, Lord.
salvation 
We thank you, Lord, that our eyes have been opened to you. And the beautiful thing is, Lord, they were opened by you. You've done it all, Lord. It is finished because you finished it, Lord. We celebrate this morning, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We celebrate the victory in every situation over every circumstance because you've given us the victory, Lord. Through your death, burial, and resurrection and by your blood, you have purchased our inheritance, Lord. And we celebrate that this morning, Lord. Hallelujah. The unseen becomes the seen. It's the story, Lord, of all that you do. The invisible becomes visible. The invisible God becomes so real to us. Hallelujah. The eyes of the Spirit, Lord. Not only do we see you, we see your victory over every obstacle, over every attack, over every lie of the enemy. And today we stand victorious, Lord, in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You are the victory. And we bless you and praise you this morning. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team, as always. You guys do great. Appreciate you being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Sunday school kids, you can be dismissed to go downstairs. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I'm not Wild Bill Hickok by any means, but I have learned over the years to be a little nervous when there's people behind me. Praise God. You never know whose toes you may have stepped on at some point. Praise God. Amen. God bless everybody. I hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Amen. We all have uh, so much to be thankful for, and so many things to be thankful for that we're not even aware of, and yet God is doing things in our lives and in the lives of people all around us on a continuous basis. Amen. So we're excited about that, and I'm grateful that uh, the testimonies and the songs this morning were about the light and uh, how we become that light, the children of light. And, uh, we, you know, we talk a lot about grace. That is the message of the gospel. I was thinking how under the old covenant, the original covenant God made with Abram, uh, there was no law. God just made covenant with him, promised that he would fulfill these uh, promises through Abraham, to Abraham. And uh, there was no part that Abraham played, Abram later becoming Abraham, there was no part that he played other than to believe God. And the scripture says he counted that to him as righteousness. Well, now that's exactly what happens. Now there's a place in between there called the law. God made covenant with Israel, but the covenant he made with Israel was based on them doing certain things and then he would do certain things the way all covenants are. But with Abram, God made covenant with Abraham, and he didn't ask anything of Abram. He just said, this is what I'm going to do. And he he made the covenant. Abram was passed out, if you remember, if you actually read the story. He was out cold. And God just passed down through the uh, sacrifices and uh, made covenant. Well, then with Israel, uh, the covenant of law was was a dual responsibility. In other words, God promised to do certain things for them if they would do certain things in terms of their uh, religious uh, rights. And, of course, we know they failed miserably. But the interesting thing is God kept the covenant with Abraham, and, in fact, that covenant is still being kept to this day and will throughout eternity. Israel will be saved. Israel will be brought. I mean, it's not over for them because God has a covenant with Abram, who is the first Hebrew. And... uh, 
even though Israel fails within their covenant that they have with God in terms of the law and the, the, the sacrifices and so on and so forth, the original covenant that God made with Abraham is still ongoing. It will never end. In fact, we are recipient of that blessings from that covenant even to today. But the covenant that God made with us is just that same kind of covenant because he made it with himself. Abram couldn't undo the covenant. If you look at his life, he did plenty of stuff that was unfaithful to the covenant in terms of what you would think would be expected of him. He was going to go to a land God sent him to, but he didn't stay there when he was supposed to. He didn't stay there and trust God for the, for the food and the famine, right? But God was still faithful to him and is still faithful to him to this day. So our, our covenant is the same. It's God's covenant with himself. And we are the beneficiaries. Yeah. And the only thing we do is believe. Yes. And God calls that righteous. We, we, that declares us to be righteous simply because we believe, not because of anything else that we do. Well, now, in the context of all of this, religion, society, cultures have all kind of twisted this and to where there is no pure God covenant it's all ends up being, there's a part that we play in this. That's the message, for the most part, that has been given to the church, but it's also the message that has been portrayed to the world, yeah. either, either overtly or you know, kind of backhandedly, that yeah, you've got a part, you've got to play. You've got to get your act together, and we, we talk about repentance as being something that we stop doing or, or we fix or whatever. When repentance is just simply to change your mind, to quit thinking the way you've been thinking. But if we don't give them any new thing to think, how can they think the new thought, right? I mean, they're, they're just trying to fix themselves so that they can be acceptable somehow to God who has already made them acceptable in Christ. So just like everything from uh, the original... Uh, message that Jesus brought, which grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Paul's uh, greater revelation than the other apostles, the greater revelation that he had was grace. I mean, it wasn't like he just didn't get more information about the things that they already knew. He had an insight into grace and into what the true gospel was that nobody else really got. It took them most of their lives to really begin to understand it. In fact, you know, different uh, uh, disciples and apostles even said things like, you know, Paul's teaching, it's hard. It's hard to understand because it conflicted so much with their Judaic background that it just seemed like it's just too far out there. But Paul said himself, hey, I was taken up into the third heaven. I didn't get this thing down here out of a book. All the, all the revelation that I had from the Old Testament was enlightened or brought to light by being in the presence of God, by being brought into a, a manifest presence of God in some way. He couldn't even talk about it. He couldn't even explain it himself. I mean, how have you ever had an experience with God that you just can't quite explain to anybody else? You know it was real, you know, but it, just to try to explain it doesn't work. So I think what's happening is that over the years, because after about two, three hundred years, the church had uh, digressed, if you will. It went backwards. And the, out of that becomes what we now know as the Catholic Church in some form or another. I mean, it, it had, I don't mean to sound disrespectful to the Catholic Church, but I'm just saying it had, it had moved away from the original message that had been taught, and it had become this hierarchy and this, uh, like, corporate kind of mentality. And that went on for centuries. Actually, and it wasn't until the Reformation that we began to see what we're seeing at the Reformation is not new things, it's the original things being brought back. Right. So people are getting revelations of something that already existed, that already was at some point, but had not been uh, manifested or, or taught or preached or believed in. And so everything that we see from the Reformation on is, is that very thing. You have all these original truths coming to people uh, that are, you know, you could say, well, they've come out of Catholicism, you know, into Protestantism. But the truth is, man, they, they're so close. I mean, go to a Lutheran church and, some, and, and I mean, it, you, 
yeah, there's a difference. Obviously, there's differences, but there's still a lot of the things are the same. You know, a lot of the, it's the same stuff. And I'm not just talking about Lutherans. You could be just pick a church, but uh, I, I'm just saying it because of Martin Luther being the one that really broke away. But all of these Calvin and, uh, you, you know, the Baptists, the Anabaptists, the, all the way down through the line, uh, uh, all the way up to the turn of the last century when we had the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Ghost had been poured out in individual ways all through the centuries. It wasn't like God quit allowing people to operate in the specific baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's just that it was isolated and, and, and it wasn't a part of a major movement really until the late 1800s, early 1900s when we know things like the Welsh Revival and, and uh, Azusa Street and all of these Kansas uh, where, where the Holy Spirit just started being poured out because people started reaching out and believing that it was possible for this to happen. And certainly then it did. And so that brings, instead of everybody embracing it, you know, it just starts another denomination or two. Well, I think that this message of grace, this is, the, this is where God's been trying to get us to since the Reformation. Actually, he's trying to get us back to the beginning, back to what that purity of the gospel was, the simplicity of Jesus Christ and the finished work of the cross. That's why I think we're so close to the end because it isn't until all these things are fulfilled until all of this this real revelation of God uh, is expressed and preached to where everybody can receive it that the end can come now what all that means I don't exactly know except that I feel like we are privileged to be in the last days and to have this revelation in such a way that it really does usher in the last great move of God. And it's by us. I mean, Jesus is coming when it's done. After we've made his enemies, or put his enemies under his feet, or made them his footstool. So we are the body of Christ. We are the express image of God in this earth today. Well then, I think it's time that we started being a accurate expression, rather than a, you know, dressed up human with certain behaviors that are supposed to represent God. When the only real representation that we have scripturally that ideally and, and specifically perfectly identifies God is love and grace. And we've done everything else. Why not give it a shot? You know, I mean, maybe, just maybe there's something to this, right? So that's what I want to talk about. Because if, if people are going to be, we've done a lot about trying to get people into our churches, into our denominations, into our belief systems. What about getting them to Jesus? What about getting them to God and forget about all the rest of it? Let God build the church and we'll just point people to Jesus. And he'll add to the church daily such as should be saved. Because we've been adding to denominations and we've been adding to organizations, but we haven't been adding much you know, to the true identity of God in terms of his body, how it really reflects. And most of us know that. We, we've all got, had bad experiences, uh, you know, religiously speaking, where we've been burnt or we've had a bad experience where somebody, you know, prophesied some crazy thing or did some stupid thing to hurt you or to hurt somebody you care about and caused them to run like their rear end was on fire to get away from the church. And, and you hear it all the time. But you don't, it doesn't take long to start having conversations. Well, you know, I went to this, and this is what they did, and it was just so phony and blah, 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 blah. And you stand there trying to undo something, you know, that is so deeply set in this person that you just feel like you're beat head against the wall. No matter how much you tell them God loves them, no matter how much you tell them, well, that was just that place. You can't blame everybody for that. But then when they see it so many times in a life, it's hard to, it's hard to recover from that. So this is what I want to talk about. This is our call. This is what God has called the body to do. The same thing Jesus did. Not another thing, not a bigger thing, not a different thing. The thing that Jesus did. Represent God. But do it the right way. Not by how good you are or how nice you are or anything else, but by how honest you are about what the Word of God actually says. You'll, you'll, people will 
will come to God, and then it becomes a thing between them and God and not between them and you and God and not between them and you and your church or them and you and your denomination or your creeds and, and so on and so forth. But you get them to God. God can do this. He doesn't have a problem. I mean, think about our own lives. He's done stuff with us that he had to overcome us to do it. I mean, we none of us can take credit for it. We, yeah, well, maybe we got on a path and we were moving towards God, but a lot of times it was parallel to God. It was, you know, it was all, and it was all, sometimes for me it was the opposite direction from God. But God can do this in a person's life. He can do it because it isn't about how good we are. God made a covenant with us, and he's going to make this thing happen. It's going to happen, and he's going to be the one to do it. He just needs our cooperation in terms of reaching other people. So that's what I want to talk about. And uh, so let's, let's begin with, I'm going to read several scriptures here to get started just to put things in context here. But let's begin with Matthew chapter 9, uh, verses 9 through 13, Sheila. And I, I want to be just plain and simple forward. I'm not, I don't want to, this is not a, you know, deep theological thing. This is, just, we ought to be able to understand this stuff, and we ought to be able to explain it to other people, and not, not in a theological way, but in a human to human way. As Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, follow me, and he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now that, just that, ought to tell us a lot of the approaches that we've used. And I say we, I'm just being generic. I'm just talking about the church in general. Have used, have been bogus from the very beginning. We've approached it in the wrong way. So it's no wonder that we're getting wrong results, or at least skewed results, right? Right? All right, John chapter 12, verse 44 through 46. So we just need to look at the scriptures and believe that they are saying exactly what they're saying, and they mean just what they mean. They, it's not, you know, it isn't that complicated, I guess is what I'm saying. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. Now, I mean, we got people that think, well, Jesus is this and Jesus is that, but that's not God. I mean, Jesus is some other thing, maybe a lesser thing, maybe equal, but not the same. Not, not, but he is. He's, he said, if you're believing on me, you're believing on God. You're believing in God. So there, it isn't like you can believe in Jesus but not believe in God or believe in God and not believe in Jesus. Him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth he, him that sent me. You're, that's it. That's him. That's, what you're, that's all you're ever going to see of God. You're not going to see a manifestation of the Father of glory in heaven. The only God you're ever going to see is Jesus. I'm not saying there isn't a Father. You know, I'm, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying he is invisible. And the manifestation of that invisible God is Jesus Christ. That's it. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. So he comes as a light. He comes as a revelation, as a visible expression or manifestation of this invisible God. Right? All right. Look at, let's stay in John chapter 12, but back up to uh, verses 35 and 36. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, 
lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. When, whenever you see the Pharisees, he talked about when he met Matthew, you know, and he goes to his place to eat, and the, there were Pharisees and scribes and others that came uh, to that meal. Whenever you see religious people, and we'll just say Pharisees, you can attach any, you know, name you want to, uh, to them, but religious zealots, religious people, uh, denominationally, you know, stuck, uh, whenever, whenever you see that, they're usually doing the same thing. They're always doing the same thing. And that thing is pointing out sinners. Whether it's from the pulpit of the church or just in their life. You know, they're just, that's, just, that's, that's always the focus. And the reason is they don't understand, didn't understand, and still don't understand the love of God. They're always trying to water it down or dilute it or, or twist it or to make it fit a certain way. They just don't understand it. They, they impose judgment without mercy. They, they put punishment without love. You know, everybody knows sometimes your kids need to be punished. But you don't want to do it just because you're mean or because you're angry or because you're frustrated. Right? You want to do it out of love. You want there to be something positive come out of this correction, right? So they, they, they criticize without any kind of understanding. I mean, it's one thing to criticize a person uh, for doing bad stuff. But you don't know anything about that person. For all you know... They may have been raised in a cave, in a cubbyhole somewhere. Their parents might have locked them, chained them to a, you know, to a bed somewhere or you know, made them sleep with the pigs. You don't know what's going on in that person's life. I'm not excusing behavior. I'm just saying people got issues. I mean, people behave most of the time because of behavior that's been pointed to them. It's rare that you find someone, it happens, but it's rare that you find someone who is loved in a balanced kind of uh, atmosphere uh, of correction and love and direction and, and support and, and encouragement to be dis totally dysfunctional. I mean, it happens. Every once in a while, you'll get the quirk and the, you know, the abnormal kind of thing. But most of the time, good people were raised by good people. They were in a good environment. They, you know, now there are some people that have horrible backgrounds and turn out to be pretty decent people anyhow. But generally, we're a reflection of our life, you know, of the kind of life that we live. And so we make judgments and criticisms without enough information to really do it the way we should. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. This is scripture that I, I use Wednesday night. And I'm not going to repeat that stuff, but I, there's a couple of things that I think that are important for all of us to, uh, to see here. Now, here in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 15, he says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. And what he's actually saying here is, see to it, this is Paul, I believe, is the writer of Hebrews. And he's saying, see to it that nobody misses the grace of God. This is the key to everything else. You can have all of the other, you know, religious stuff, but make sure that nobody misses the grace of God. That's the key to everything. Amen? And here's the deal. According to everything in the New Covenant, we are, you and I, believers recipients of grace are the sole dispensers of grace. We're the only ones that can do it. The church is the only one that can because they're the only ones that have received it. And now if we're not dispensing grace, we're dispensing something else, and grace is the only thing that can change a person's life. Yours, mine, anybody's. Amen? Now, 
let's look at this. Uh, how do we dispense it, though? I guess that's the problem. Now, we, we, we here have a pretty good, not a perfect, you know, not complete, but a pretty good idea of what God has done for us. We're, we're learning about this grace, about this love, about this just unmerited favor, this stuff that's just beyond natural thinking, and yet it's true. And it really is. We're beginning to understand this is good news. This really is good news. Amen. But how do we, how do we get it from us to them? That's the question. That's, that's, where we're, that's where we struggle because we've got all this history, this baggage that seemed to make sense in some ways, and you've got all the other uh, churches and denominations and believers in different areas and levels of, of understanding and revelation and acceptance and so forth, and they're all trying to do the same thing. But it ain't working. It's just not working, not, not, not like it should. I'm not, it, it can't be, or we would have not needed to hear what we've been hearing, all of us, myself, for the last several years three, four, five years especially. Because uh, I thought I knew pretty much what I needed to know as far as salvation was concerned. And that's what I generally shared with other people. But I knew that it wasn't working perfectly for me, for sure. And I knew, having pastored and interacted with people, it wasn't working very well for most of them either. So it was a huge dilemma. I, I resigned a church and, and an uh, organization, not just for that reason, but partly because of the confusion. I could not figure out, this can't be right. This, this can't be right, but yet I, I know I'm saved, but I don't have much joy. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't seem to be able to get much joy to other people. I try to be happy. I try to be fun around other people. But in, deep down in the living day-to-day, -day, people are miserable even with the revelation that they had. And I'm not saying they didn't have revelation because they did have. There's a beautiful, some beautiful revelation. But it wasn't the kind of revelation that was really impacting and changing their lives. In many cases, it made them arrogant and more pride, prideful and, and, and less compassionate. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 14 through 16. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. I want to do this. You know, I want, to, I want to see people saved. I want to impact people's lives, but I don't want to be a phony doing it. I, I don't want to have to put on the, you know, the robes and the glitter and the gimmickry, you know. I mean, we don't, you don't have to put on a, I used to, I used to get, troubled when I'd go to churches where they still wear the vestments and the, not just the Catholic church but there's lots of churches that still you know the pastor has to put on a robe and because it's like now you know that I got I got it you know I'm the one right but you know we do that we do it in the way we approach people even though we're not putting on some get up we are kind of giddying up you know we're we're, we're go, and we're presenting it to them in a in a religious way that they don't understand most of them and and, and if they do have any understanding of it, it scares the crap out of them. I mean, it just frightens them and intimidates them rather than us being like we would be just with a friend or a family member. You know, we feel obligated to kind of come with this Christian and kind of speak and, and approach it in a certain way. And it just, it freaks people out because it seems unreal. It seems unnatural. And, and, and to me personally, it is unnatural because that's not the way I normally am. So now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. And I'm going to read this again, because we've all, we've all read this, but let's look at it. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor or the aroma of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved, and in them that perish. To the one we are savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things, or who can figure this out? You know, it's the same smell, but to one person it's the smell of death, 
To another person, it's the smell of life. To one person, it smells like an outhouse. To the next person, it smells like a bouquet of some flowers or something, right? So Paul uses this metaphor, the aroma of Christ. And as we're seeing in our own inner relationships and interactions with others and witnessing and whatever you want to call it, that thing can have a very different effect depending on the nose, depending on the sniffer, depending on the person that you're speaking to. Now, C.S. Lewis, I've got a bunch of his books, and, and I can't honestly say that I've read all of them. I've read some of all of them. I've read enough to give a book report if I need to. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I've read several of his books and, and parts of, uh, of others. But he said, sharing your faith, it's, it's like the difference between courting a divorcee and a virgin. Now, we all know this. Because if you, if you talk to somebody who's never been exposed to any religious thing, they're, they're, they're not hard to win. They're not, they're not near as difficult. But anybody that's had any kind of, either they were raised by some radical, crazy Christians, or they were exposed as a child to some nutcase kind of religious thing, or growing up, they tried it and they failed, and they were constantly being told of what a failure they were because they couldn't stop drinking, or they couldn't stop doing this, or they got divorced, or they did this, or they did, you know, any number of things that caused them just to almost, you know, cringe anytime they get near a church. See, a divorcee, and I'm just taking this uh, from what I've heard, more than once, praise the Lord, so I'm just saying. A divorcee won't easily fall for the sweet nothings, you know, from someone who's trying to date them. And the reason is because they've heard it all before. And they are skeptical of romance because they know it can be a bummer. It can fail. It, it isn't all what it may look like in the beginning. It can turn out to be something horrible. So they're not, they're not like the virgin. They're not like the undated person who just is naive, that just believes it's going to be great. It's all going to be wonderful. I mean, how many, how many, you know, we've got children us that are older that are married, and, and, you know, you see them dating, and you're thinking, ooh, boy, I see a train wreck coming here. But you can't convince them because they haven't had a wreck yet. Yeah. You know, they, they've always escaped. You know what I mean? They're naive. They, they believe it's all going to be perfect and that I don't have to do anything but just be me after all. She loves me. I love her. You know, it's going to be great. That's what I'm saying. That's what, that's what we deal with when we're dealing with people who have had bad experiences who now we come with this kind of a virgin perspective of, oh, just take it, man. It's great. You're going to love it. And they're going, whoa, wait a minute. I've been down that road, and I got cheated on. I got ripped off. I got taken advantage of. I got all these negative stuff, you know. And so they're not so quick to just embrace it. And we, and we stand there like, Why can't they? what's wrong with them? Why don't they get it? You see what I'm saying? So the, the, the truth is, a lot of the people that we deal with, in fact, I, I'd say in, in the Western part world, the vast majority of the people that we're trying to bring the light of God to qualify as divorcees of faith. They may not have been, quote, unquote, baptized in a church somewhere, but they've been to church. They've been around churches. They've been around people. They've got the Christian TV thing they flip through when they come home drunk and depressed. And I mean, they, they know enough to be intimidated and to be freaked out and to be disappointed. Amen? But here's the deal. What they don't understand is the whole essence of this Bible, the core teaching and truth of this Bible is that God gets his family back. 
And we're not talking about that. We're talking about every other thing that they need to do or don't need to do or should stop doing and, and be this and be that. And we're not telling him God has this great love and he's determined he's going to get his family back. He's going to fix this mess and he's going to make you happy again. He's going to put you in a place where you're secure, where you're safe, where you know that you're loved, where you can share your love, where you can love without a fear of being taken advantage of or ripped off or whatever, you know? Amen. So from... From Genesis all the way through Revelation, the Bible is talking about wayward children. Children that are disillusioned, children that are bummed out, children that are just freaked out and stupid and, and for whatever reason just doing really stupid things. And the whole thing is about God's going to bring them home. It's all about how God's going to bring them home. And then this entire story ends with this huge family reunion. I was thinking about this on Thanksgiving Day. Every big, every celebration we have, Christmas, uh, Easter, uh, you know, Thanksgiving, Fourth of July, whatever it is, what do, what do we do? I mean, for the most part, what do we do? We get together. We have family. We get together with all, either all the family or whatever family can be there. Why? Because we're connected. We, it feels good to be with family. It's, it's, you know, most of the time, <laughs> praise the Lord. But, you know, I mean, it's just, that's what we crave. We crave that acceptance, that you know, we know that in that family, we all got our dysfunctions. And my brother loves to say, there's no such thing as uh, uh, a, a non-dysfunctional family. If it's a family, it's dysfunctional. It's got people in it. People are dysfunctional. But that's what makes it our dysfunction. You know, it's like they used to say about Harry Truman, he's an SOB, but he's our SOB, you know. And so that's kind of the way, you know, we look at it. Other people look in from the outside, they go, oh, whoa, I just, you know, I... I wouldn't want to spend 20 minutes with that bunch. But for us, it's good. You know, it's all, it's fine. And we're, we're comfortable because we've learned to love each other. We just, we just want that connection. And that's what God is saying. That's what the whole idea of the human race. That's God's attitude towards us is, I want to have this reunion, and we're going to have one, and it's going to go on forever. And you're going to feel safe, and you're going to feel like you belong, and, and that you fit, and you're not the oddball, and you're not the strange one. You belong here. And everybody says, good, we're glad you're here. You're, we're glad you're part of us. You, you fit, you know. And so that's, that's the whole idea. That's what we're seeing in the book of Revelation. That's the good news. I mean, we, we, we pick out all the bizarre and strange things, but the truth is that book of Revelation wraps up with a big reunion, a big feast, a big family get-together, and everybody's in a good mood. Everybody's having a good time, and we got the best food and and everybody's celebrating and Jesus breaks out the wine that he hasn't drank since he was here yeah. amen yeah. and it's not a BYOB it's a he's he, it's a free bar the bar is open and I'm serving praise the Lord yeah. hallelujah all right Luke uh, chapter 15 and we'll just start with verse 1 I uh, maybe put up 1 through 3 or 4 and I won't read it all because we're all real familiar with these anyway it's all about the lost coin the lost sheep uh, the, the the prodigal son and that's what this uh, Luke 15 is, is all about. So we're not going to read all of it for the sake of time. But uh, Luke 15, 1 will be fine. Just 1 through 3 or anywhere in that area. Whatever you can get up on the screen would be all right. So then near, near unto him all the publicans and sinners for him, here to, to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, If you will, uh, Sheila, go on down through you like five or six. What man of you having a hundred sheep, and he loses one, right? Then he goes on to say, you know, he goes out, he, he does everything he can, he leaves the ninety and nine, and he goes out and he hunts for the, the one, finds it, takes it up, celebrates, goes back home, and they have a feast. He tells all of his friends, I found the sheep, I found the one that was lost, the woman with the coin. It's the same parable. It's the same story. He just tells it in several different ways. And then he comes down now, he's telling this not to the, to the people so much as to the religious people. Right, right. Because the, it, immediately the beginning of that whole dissertation is about these people. These publicans, are, or not these publicans, but these uh, Pharisees and scribes and stuff are there, are gathered there. And that's why he starts telling this story. And then he gets down to the, to the prodigal son. And you all know the story, so I'm not going to read it. You, you just know it's all about the son that's lost. He comes home. The father celebrates it. They have a feast. And, and, and it's all the thing. So there's, there's two important points in all of these. First, the lost are of the highest priority to God. 
It isn't the saved people are not the priority. They're taken care of. They're, they're met, their needs are met. They're fed. They're, 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 they, they've got an inheritance. And it isn't that he doesn't care. It's just his priority is the lost. Yes. Praise the Lord. So it ought to be our priority. Right. And they're, they're worth, because of this priority, they're worth whatever effort it takes to find them. And he shows us that. Jesus, I mean, he went the limit. He did everything to reach us, up to and including his death. The second thing is, when they find the lost, the lost deserve to be celebrated. Not because of anything they did, but just because they once were lost, but now they're found. And let's have a party. Let's, ha let's have a celebration. The scripture even says over every lost person that gets saved, all of heaven rejoices. They party all the time. Yeah. We should be. We should be celebrating every time a lost person comes to Christ. Every time a, a person believes in Jesus. Not, a, not about whatever else goes on in their life or is changing, but the fact that they have believed in God. Because you think about it, and we've, I've heard this before. It's not new with me, but what did that sheep do to be found, to, 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 to repent. He didn't do anything except he agreed to be fine, found, and, and to be picked up and taken back to the fold. The coin couldn't do anything to be found. You know, the, the sheep couldn't do anything. It's the finder comes and does everything. All the thing does is agree. It just, like us, it didn't do anything. It was the same sheep saved as it was lost in terms of its external realities. The coin didn't change. It didn't become a quarter if it was a dime. It's still a dime. But it's now a found dime instead of a lost dime. Now it belongs. Now it fits. Now it, now it has a place. It, it, it has uh, reason. Amen? So the, the stories were a threat to the religious people. These stories were a threat to the rabbis and to these uh, Pharisees and, and Sadducees and so forth. Because the prodigal, if you read the story, what the prodigal does is he tears down all of our neat religious categories that separate responsible from irresponsible. He was as irresponsible coming back as he was going. He was trying to figure out a way to get back into the graces and get something uh, to, to sustain himself. It tears down those, those categories of obedience from disobedient and rebellious. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because there's no difference between the disobedient out here and my quote-unquote obedience in here because I'm still disobedient. I'm still rebellious in a lot of ways. I, and Jesus showed that in his message where he says, you know, you, you're an adulterer because you commit adultery. I'm saying you're an adulterer because you just thought the thought, you know. I'm saying you're a murderer because you, you got mad at somebody and I could have killed a tow truck or a snow plower uh, the other night. Just in a split second I could have done it and, been, and felt really bad about it afterwards. But at the moment I thought, he deserves to die. Does he know this is my vehicle? And so you understand what I'm saying? We, we, they... There's no difference. The only difference is I've been found and they're still lost. There's no difference between the moral and the immoral because we know we're all capable of immoral behavior. Thoughts, actions, attitudes. We want to fine line it. You know, we want to cut. Well, I, I didn't actually do it. I thought about it. I would have liked to do it, but I'm... I'm too scared to steal. It isn't that I wouldn't like to rip somebody off for several million dollars. I just don't want to get caught and go to jail and not be able to spend it. I mean, if we're honest, that's the truth. You know, I mean, our morality is like the locked door only keeps an honest man out. I mean, if you want in, you're going to get in if the door is locked or not, you know. So I'm just saying, we're... we're we're phony sometimes in the way that we deal with other people because they're not as bad as us or that we're not as bad as they are in our estimation. God has already told us that 
doesn't work. When you start measuring yourselves among yourselves and by yourselves, you are in trouble because you're not thinking like me anymore, not thinking like God, right? Because that's grace. That's, what gra that's the essence of what grace is. Grace is like water. It always flows downward. Come and drink. You know, it's like, you ever been out in the Rockies or in the mountains, and you, see, you go up in the mountains, and you'll see these little, just little tiny pools. They're not much of anything. And, and uh, when the snow begins to melt, they fill, and then there's just, just a little riblet like a stream. And as it goes down the mountain, it becomes... White water. I mean, you've got raging torrents of water coming down that feel huge, huge lakes. But it starts out just a little drop. That's the way grace is. It, it, it flows. It just expands. The more it flows, the bigger it gets. The, the, the greater uh, impact it has. The greater influence that it has. Amen? So out of your belly, the Bible says, will flow rivers of living water. He, he says, you have the ability to be a little stream. That's what Suzanne was saying up here this morning. Or a creek. Or a river. Or an ocean. That fills the earth. That's what God is saying. I want you to flow like a river. I want you to just let my grace. I want people to know me by my grace. Not by my rules and regulations. He doesn't want us. He said... I don't you didn't sacrifice, but have mercy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And we know that they didn't. In fact, whenever the, the religious people got mad at Jesus, they called him a Samaritan. It was like the worst slur you could put against somebody uh, if they were Jewish. Okay, let's jump over to verse 13 and 14. Same, just stay in the same uh, John chapter 2, or excuse me, John chapter 4, but just go to verse 13, 14. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Okay, verse 18. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that sayest thou truly. You know, I'm just jumping around here because uh, for the sake of time. But he said, bring your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. And I said, yeah, that's what he's saying here. I know, you've had five, and the guy you're living with right now is not your husband. Then go, let's go to verse 20 through 24. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him, in spirit and in truth. So here's, here's the point in all of this. This woman had found an alternative religion. Some, some way of meeting her spiritual needs. So we look at this group and that group and this organization and that organization. And, and of course we immediately write them off. I'm talking still in general terms here because they're not part of our group because they don't believe what we believe exactly. They don't come to the same conclusions 
about the, the scriptures and so on and so forth. But what if Jesus had gotten into an argument with her about their differences over where to worship? What if he had just made that the whole point of this argument? Uh, you, you, you've blown it, you've missed it, you're an idiot, you don't understand Jerusalem or nothing. Instead, he touches the thirst that was so evident. Not the theology. He goes after the thirst. The thirst that had caused her the, the emptiness, the, the, the lack that caused her to have five husbands and, and now be with another one. Something was missing in her life, something she longed for, something she wanted but couldn't somehow get it. That was the thirst, and that's what Jesus addresses. He doesn't address their differences in theology. He doesn't address their differences in their religious rituals. He immediately goes for the thing that is her big problem, the thirst. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in you a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So what I'm saying, what I think the scripture is saying is that we have to tune into the choice and choices that people have made. You know what I'm saying? Don't make, don't make their choices a separation, but make them a point of understanding. To just look at the choice that they've made and say, Are you moron, don't you know me? I, I don't ever, I've never done drugs. I'm not going to do drugs. And how can you, how can you do those over and over and over? Can't you see what it's doing to your life? Can't you see what it's doing to your health? Can't you see what it's doing to your family? Yeah, it's obviously a really bad choice, but there's something, there's a thirst that's underneath that choice that they're making, and that's what God wants us to see. To quit making the choice the problem, but let the choice be the, what magnifies the thirst that that person has, that they need, there's a longing there for God, an emptiness, a lack, amen, uh, that, that, that they need eternal water. Because otherwise we're not operating in love. We need to tune in to the underlying thirst, the thing that is the real issue. And you don't need to be a psychiatrist, a psychologist. I mean, come on, we all, you look at people and you go, whoa, they got some problems, they got some issues. But why? What is the problem? The problem isn't that they can't get enough dope or enough husbands or enough wives or enough whatever it is. The problem is there's something lacking and they're trying to fill that lack. They're trying to satisfy that thirst with something that will never satisfy their thirst. There's only one water that's going to satisfy that thirst and that's what we need to get them to. Anybody ever see the movie A Beautiful Mind? Russell Crowe? It's a cool show. This guy's a genius. But he's schizophrenic. And in that movie, his wife tells him, she says, she's asked how she copes with, with her husband's schizophrenia because he's whacked. He's out there, you know. And here's what she says. I look at him, and I force myself to see the man that I married, and he becomes that man. He's transformed into someone that I love. And I'm transformed into someone that loves him. In other words, she looks at him with the eyes of grace. And listen, we do it all the time. We all do. Intuitively, we do it with our own family members. We do it with people that we choose to love, even though they got issues. They, there's stuff that other people can't even be around them for five minutes. But we choose to see them as something special, as something that we care about, as something that has value. And they become that to us because of that, and we become what we're, you know, I, I call it, I, I say it all the time, if you can't feel it, fake it. You know, because eventually you'll start feeling it. If you, if you just start choosing to love somebody, I'm talking about somebody that just isn't that lovable, you know, eventually you'll find out 
You know, they're not bad. I'm not talking about romance. I'm not talking about marriage. I'm just talking about people that you deal with. And the next thing you know, not only are they lovable, but you're loving them. And that's basically what grace is. It's choosing to love. It's choosing to give value, uh, to see that person as something that's worth being loved, something that's worth giving your love to. Amen? Amen? Jesus had this uncanny ability to look at everybody with eyes of grace. He saw everybody as lovable. And as he loves them, they begin to become the thing that he loves. And the next thing you know, the potential that he sees in them starts to manifest. That's what we call being born again. That's what we call people's lives transformed. You know, somebody was a drug addict, somebody was a this, somebody was a that, and then they get saved. And five years later, people see him and go, oh my God, I can't believe how you've changed. Well, I suppose to somebody from the outside, you've changed. But to Jesus, you haven't changed at all. You've been transformed by his love. By his grace. He sees you that way. He's always seen you that way. We see it as a big change, and he's saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. This will just keep on going. This will just keep on going. It just That's the way it works. Amen? Second Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things <clears throat> are become new. We had the same challenge that Paul was giving to the, the church in Corinth. To see Jesus not to see the people, not to see the individual, not to see the circumstances, not to see the stuff, but to see Jesus. I, I see, he's, Paul said in another place, he said, I don't see anything but Christ and him crucified. I look at somebody, that's all I see. Now we know what we see, but we can make a decision. We can choose like the wife in the beautiful mind to see the beauty, the good, the lovely, yes. right? Yes. And they become that. Yes. But they don't become it unless somebody loves them, unless somebody exhibits that grace. That's what we're here for. That's why we're here. That's our reason. Not to hand out tracts to get them to join our club or to get our little group bigger or our denomination or our particular creeds, but to get them to Jesus, to get them to grace, to get them to love, to get them to see that their life can be different. Their life doesn't have to be the same, but we don't do that by trying to change their life. You know, in the, in the 1800s, before there was uh, antibiotics and uh, penicillin and things like that, the, 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 the cure to infection was amputation. Now, that's pretty severe. You know, you get a wound in your leg, and they, they cut the leg off. That's what the church does. Instead of addressing the infection, we're dealing with the external stink of the, in, of the wound, and we just we say, cut it off, cut it off. Jesus mocks it. He said, you know, it's better to go through life with one eye. It, I, I, you know, he's speaking spiritually, but that's what we do. Otherwise, this room would be filled with one-legged, one-armed, one-eyed. Here we go, because we've all looked at something we shouldn't have. We've all touched something we shouldn't have. We've all done something we shouldn't have. But we know that we don't mean it literally, but we still operate that way spiritually. Praise the Lord. So the church hasn't been doing a real good job of this. If they had, this would be good news to people instead of bad news. Instead of being afraid, instead of being intimidated, instead of being bummed out, they would be welcoming the good news. 
There was an outfit called uh, Rutledge Surveys, and they did a survey of Americans. And this is interesting. You, you can't hardly believe it, but it's a fact. They did a survey, and the, in that survey, Americans were asked what words they would most like to hear. And the three most uh, given answers to that were, first of all, the first one was uh, one they predicted, which is, I love you. The second one was, I forgive you. The third one blew everybody's mind, and it was, supper's ready. <laughs> Honestly. And if you think about it, it's uncanny because that is basically the gospel. God loves you. God forgives you. And he's preparing a big feast. And you're invited to this celebration, to this supper. Now that's people. That's secular people. That's people, just people. Not religious people trying to fit this in and make it sound like the gospel, just people at random ask. Because innately, that's what people feel. They need it, and they're not getting it. They want love. They want forgiveness. They want family. They want connection. They want acceptance. They want to fit. They want to belong. They want to be invited to the reunion. You know, they want to be a part of that family. And just because they can't express it doesn't mean it's not true. The gospel is good news. Amen. The gospel is God loves you. God's forgiven you. And come on to dinner. Amen. I'm going to have to jump around here a little bit because I want to get you out of here. It's getting, we're getting close to what should be quitting time. But in Ephesians 1, let's, let's look at this, <laughs> Sheila. Ephesians 1.13. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And that word salvation in the Hebrew means to broaden. It, it means uh, to be broad or to be spacious. It means to enlarge. Uh, it's a sense of deliverance from an existence that, is be, that has become compressed, confined, and cramped. God wants to set us free. God wants us to feel at liberty. He's come to give us life and that more abundantly. He's come to set the captives free. He's come to release us from a life of confinement and, and narrowness and, and uh, uh, sense of constraint and restriction to a place of freedom. And what does religion do? It just redefines the constraints. It, it doesn't take away constraints or restrictions. It just gives them a different identity or, 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 or a different approach. And you just leave one set of chains for another set of chains. That's why he never came to give us religion. He came to set us free. Amen. He came to make us part of his family. He came to love us and forgive us. And all he asks of us is that we keep the river flowing. That the grace would continue that what we have received, freely you've received, freely give. That you'll love the way he loves. That you'll look at people the way he looks at people. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.4 says we are the uh, recipients of his divine nature through all these precious promises. His nature. We have his nature. His nature is love. His nature is grace. We have it. We don't have to hide like Adam and Eve in the garden. We don't have to be fearful of God. We've been forgiven. Amen. We've been transformed. So that we can actually participate in the divine nature. How do you participate in the divine nature? I never do anything wrong. I'm always good. I'm perfect. I'm righteous. Yes, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. But the way I participate in the divine nature is by giving grace, yeah. by releasing my nature, the nature of God that's in me, that sealed me. I release love. I release grace. Yeah. 
I release forgiveness. I release mercy. I look like Jesus to that person. Because if I'm trying to just be Mr. Perfect, I'll be found out in a heartbeat, believe me. And then everything becomes phony. Then the whole church now is a fake. Now everything that you're teaching is a fake. Why? Because I'm not perfect. So let's quit trying to be perfect, and let's just start being graceful and loving. Praise God. See, the, the only reason, or a big reason at least for the church, is that it's a, pla a place where you can receive grace, because the world doesn't do that. The world is all based on, you know, if you do enough good stuff, you'll get, you know, what goes around comes around, karma, whatever. But the church is supposed to be a place where anybody can come and receive grace. Right. Saved, unsaved, whatever. Right. Praise the Lord. It, it brings forgiven people together with the purpose of equipping them to dispense grace to others. That's what the gospel is about. That's what church is supposed to be for. Not to teach you how to be good, not to beat you up for being wrong or bad or, or misbehaving, but to equip you to dispense the grace that God has given you. And we haven't done it. And that's why people don't want to come to church. Because they don't want to get beat up. They don't want to hear how bad they are. They already know how bad they are. Right. We've been telling them for 2,000 years. There's a story. This was on uh, Facebook. It was, or Go it, was on, uh, it was Googled to be, uh, pardon me if I sound like I don't know what I'm talking about because I don't. <laughs> the only thing I know about Facebook is what I see over my wife's shoulder. But uh, it was one of the most Googled posts on Facebook. I think that's what it was a few months back. And here's what it is. Philosophy is like being in a dark room and looking for a black cat. Metaphysics is like being in a dark room and looking for a black cat that isn't there. Theology is like being in a dark room and looking for a black cat that isn't there and shouting, I found it. Science is like being in a dark room and looking for a black cat using a flashlight. Now that says a lot. It's comical and it's funny, but it says a lot about the American yeah. attitude about faith and religion. It's a fantasy. The majority of people, or I, I won't say majority, but a large segment of the American population see religion simply as a fantasy. It's not real. People are just saying, I found a black cat in that dark room, and there isn't even one there. Why? Because they don't see the cat. They don't see any expression of the cat. They don't see anything that looks like the cat. They don't see us carrying the cat. It's phony because there's no real manifestation of the cat. So, you know, <laughs> praise the Lord. It's getting heavy now. I was watching uh, JLTV, you know, the Jewish channel, and uh, JTL or whatever it is. And uh, they had done some research into Islam and found, you know, they believe the, the, if they are martyred, the guys anyway, I don't know what the women get, but the guys get 72 virgins. After a lot of research and studying the ancient scriptures or scrolls of Muhammad, they found out that there was an error. And what actually happens is they get one 72 year old virgin. <laughs> Things are not always what they seem to be, praise the Lord. I just thought I'd throw that out there. In case any of you are thinking about car bombing the church or anything, I don't want to think twice about that, praise the Lord. But anyhow, 
we, we need to show them the cat. You know, I mean, we need to let them see that this is something that's real. And you, you can talk about it all you want to. We can, you know, use all of our religious rhetoric and, and, and language and things that make sense to us when we're talking, but they don't make any sense to anybody else. They sound phony. This isn't really about religion or black cats for that matter. It's about a relationship with a person whose name is Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh. You know, religion's qualification for, for the kingdom and civilization's qualifications are different than Jesus. Jesus, when you read the parables, and we just glanced at a couple of them here, but those, those parables, those stories, consistently make the wrong character the hero. I mean, from a worldview or from a religious view, if you're honest, the people he's declaring to be heroes, it's wrong. It's just not, it's just wrong, period. It's the prodigal son, not the responsible elder brother. It's the good Samaritan, the Samaritans, one that everybody hated. Not the good rabbi, not the good priest. It's the scabby beggar, not the rich man. The people that most attracted Jesus are the undesirables. The half-breed woman who didn't have a right to come to Christ. He's attracted to her. He's drawn to her. The blind beggar. The ten exiled le uh, lepers. The prostitutes. The Roman soldier. The degree that we live out the message that we say we believe, treating everybody with dignity and, and with worth, is the degree that we will succeed in dispensing the good news of the gospel, the grace of God. Th this world is thirsty. And we just keep loading them up with well water. And they just keep on thirsting. And they just need Jesus. They just need grace. What are we, what are we afraid of? He told it, who you forgive, I'll forgive. What you bind, I'll bind. What you loose, I'll loose. What are we nervous about? You're afraid to forgive somebody that they might do something bad? They're doing bad anyhow. Forgive them. You know what I mean? If you think... If you think my forgiving them is going to create some great ripple effect that's going to you know, cause the end of Western civilization, forget it. It's on its way anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. You're not going to mess it up. This is God's business. Yeah. It doesn't cost you anything to forgive them. It doesn't cost you anything to say, hey, I love you. It's okay. You know, God cares. Let God fix them. I got a lot of books by Graham Greene. I love this guy. I love mysteries. He wrote The, uh, the Tailor of Panama, Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy. I, I've got probably half a dozen of, uh, of his novels at home. I, they're great mysteries. But he wrote a short story not long before he died. And he always had a conflict with religion. He was a Catholic by birth. But he had this thing going on all the time about whether he believed or didn't believe in the, in the church and so on and so forth. Like a lot of people, you know, he wanted to believe, but there was so much junk there that it was hard to believe. But he wrote this, this uh, short story. It wasn't too long before he died, and it was called The Last Word. And it's all about a civilization where uh, religion is literally stomp, stamped out, eliminated. And they kill off every believing Christian, everybody who is a believer, everybody who claims or professes to be or could be found out to be. They kill them all. And there's only one left. And it's this old, old man who was the Pope. 
And they've held him in prison for years and years and years. And he's been there all this time. And, of course, he's the obvious symbol and icon and uh, so forth of, of religion itself. And so this general brings him out one day out of the cell, brings him out into this courtyard, and there's a little table there. And he takes a bottle of whiskey, pours two drinks, and the pope looks at the general and he says, are you going to kill me? And the general says, yes, I am. And the general picks up his drink, kind of a little tentative and shaky, and gulps it down. And the pope picks up his, kind of holds it up to the sky, and says, Corpus Domini Nostre, the body of Christ, and so forth. And then there's a bang! And the general kills him. And his, the story ends with this sentence. Between the pressure on the trigger and the bullet exploding, a strange and frightening doubt crossed the general's mind. Is it possible that what this man believed may be true? That is the reality of the vast majority of people on this planet who claim to be agnostic, who claim to be atheists or borderline believers, <clears throat> is it possible that this is true? Jesus told <clears throat> all of these stories, these truths, and he told them in parables. stories that were shaped from the listeners' daily lives. Not deep theological arguments, but just stories that they related to that was part of their life, you know, the, where they worked, what they did, their families, and so on and so forth. Things that, that meant something to them. And Emily Dickinson said, tell the truth, but tell it slant. In other words, italicize it. Make it yours. You can't shove religion down people's throats. You can't force feed them doctrine. If we do, we reduce the people, the individuals. We diminish these human beings from individuals that God loves to a cause. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus made it personal. He didn't try to impress them with all of his knowledge. God knows he had it all. He knew it all. But that isn't the way he taught them. He taught them like they was his neighbor. They were a friend. They were, and he spoke to them way, the way they could understand it. God loves you. God cares about you. He doesn't want you lost. He'll do whatever it takes to get you, to find you, to restore you, to bring you back into his family. All he asks is just let him. I'm not asking you to give up your drinking. I'm not asking you to stop smoking. I'm not asking you to stop living with the person you're living with. I'm not asking you to do this or to do that. I'm just asking you to just give him a chance to love you. That's all he wants. You don't need to do anything else. There's nothing else you can do. And just let the love of God and the grace of God move in their life and see if there won't be more positive results from that than all of the declarations, all the threats, all the intimidations, all the rules and all the regulations that we've been given over the years could ever do. So tell them the truth, but tell them slant. Amen? Tell them with your own words, with your own feelings, with your own experience. And let it be real to them. Let it be not just another... Bible study or, you know, I, I don't mean to diminish the value of that. I'm just saying Bible studies are great. But they got to believe it. or they, It's a waste of time for everybody. It because, if they don't understand the motive behind that, it just looks like a bunch of rules and regulations and then it ends up becoming a debate. I taught a lot of Bible studies, believe me. We taught home Bible studies for years and years in Texas, up here in Iowa. I know what it can turn into. 
People need Jesus. Praise the Lord. All right, let's close. Hebrews, can we do it? Hebrews chapter 4, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. This isn't a cause. It's humanity. It's, it's people. It's God. Like I said, you know, in the natural, I want to see this place filled, overflowing. But build a bigger church. Get a, you know, all that stuff. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. It's not going to change what we do. But I don't want to just have a building filled with a bunch of people. I want to see people's lives changed. I want to be honest about it. I don't want to, I don't want them, I don't want to see that, I don't want to have somebody see me picking up a six pack of Coors Light somewhere and thinking, my life's over. The pastor drinks beer. You know what I'm saying? I'm not encouraging people to drink or don't drink. I'm, I'm just saying. I know what happens in people's lives. I don't want to have somebody pull up behind me and I'm having a momentary fl flip out because somebody just flipped me the bird and pulled out in front of me and cursed me out or whatever, and I go, well, same to you, sweetheart, or, you know, I love you, the Lord. You know? Or I'm, you know, I don't want this to be about me. I want to be a good person. I, I want to, you know, do the right stuff. But this is not about me. This is about Jesus. And every time we make it about people, we get discouraged. We get disappointed. We get bummed out because people are people. And we need to point them to Jesus. And if we're honest, then people can love us for who we are. We can relax and love ourselves and love one another because I don't have to be walking a tightrope all the time. And this isn't about me. You don't understand. I'm just saying... I'm talking about you. You know? It isn't about the things we've made it about. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. Let it, let, let it rather be healed. I need uh, 12, 15. Verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springeth up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Again, it's what I said at the very beginning. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. I, we've talked all about it, and I just said, you know, I made my little uh, joke about the six-pack of beer or whatever. I'm just saying... They did the same thing to Jesus. He's a drunk. He's a wine bibber. I saw him at this party. I knew I see him with these people. I, I know that person. They're, no, they're, they're on drugs. He's a drug dealer. And, and maybe Jesus was there picking up a, an ounce. You know, I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he was getting a bag. Maybe he was getting, you know, some pills. Maybe he was getting a beer. I'm not doing that. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that to cover for me. Not today. Praise the Lord. I might drink a beer. I'm, I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I'm not on drugs. I'm not trying to make an excuse for my behavior. I'm just saying, come on, we're making it about the wrong thing. Jesus went out and looked for these people and to spend time with them. Because they were sick and needed a physician. They were thirsty, and he was the only one that had the water that was going to quench them. That's who we are, church. And if we are so freaked out that we think we got to be like the Pharisees, the only place we're comfortable is with other Pharisees yeah. that sit around and point at the yeah. bad people out there or the church down the street that doesn't agree with us, then we're missing everything that we're here for. Exactly. We are here to be a light. Yes. Not a light of, of the church, not a light of our belief system, but a light of God, a light of the Lord. A revelation of grace and love and mercy. It doesn't cost us one thing to be merciful, to be graceful, and to be forgiving. Just do it. And see 
Will it work every time? I don't know because I haven't, I haven't, honestly haven't done it on a regular basis. But Jesus did and seems to be working for him. Imagine what kind of impact we could have on a community, on a family, on a neighborhood, on a city, if we really, if the church really started operating from this perspective, from this reality. Amen. I'm not saying you got to condone it. I'm talking about homosexuals. I'm ta- do, does it bother me? Of course, I'm offended by it. I'm un- uncomfortable with it. But God loves them anyhow. God still loves them. I'm not saying I'm going to embrace the lifestyle. I'm just saying if they knew that God loved them, if they knew they were accepted in some way, if they knew that there was hope, if they knew that there was something beyond, maybe, just maybe, it would have an impact on the way they go through their life. I was at the nursing home to see my mother yesterday, and on the way to her room, an old guy in a wheelchair is going like this with his pants down. If he'd have been standing up, I thought he'd from the hood, but he wasn't. He was sitting down, and his pants were down, and he, he said, come here, will you? He's like 85 years old, and so I come over not knowing what's going on, and he said, uh, could you buckle my pants for me? Put it on the last buckle. So I pull him up a little bit and, over and buckle him, and two nurses are standing about 15 feet from me down the hall looking, staring at me, and I said, whoa, I was buckling him. I was hooking him up. I wasn't unhooking him. I, I got to, you know, I'm uncomfortable, okay? So, you know, I'm not a homophobe, but look. Buckle up, fine. I'm all about that. I'll help you out if I can. But if it comes to unbuckling, you're on your own, mister. I mean, you're going to have to get some help from somewhere besides me. Hallelujah. So, I mean, I understand the uncomfortableness of the whole thing. But I wonder what kind of a difference. We can't, we're not changing anything this way, are we? Right. By condemning, by judging, by criticizing, by being hateful and everything else. Even though we've got a right in some areas to say that is so stupid. How can they do that? How can they be like that? How can, and I mean, I know that. I, I understand that. I feel the same way. Yeah. But it isn't changing anything. Right. They don't answer to me anyhow. So it doesn't cost me a thing. To say, you know what? I love you. Because God loves you. And gave himself for you. In the middle of that crap. Not my favorite sin, but just in sin, period. It's all the same to God. Doesn't cost me a thing to say, it's okay, I love you. God loves you. He wants you blessed. He wants you to know he loves you. He wants to welcome you back into the family. If the outward changes, great. If it doesn't change, that's between them and God. God will sort it all out. It's not my job. I can still love them in the middle of it. I don't have to jump into the middle of their behavior, but I can still love them in the middle of all of it. I don't have to start doing drugs to love the person that is addicted, that's hung up, that's screwed up, that's messed up because they're hungry, they're thirsty, they're aching and crying out for something that this world can't give them. So why don't we just let it flow? That's what, The only thing we've got to give them is the water of life, is the grace that God has given us. And to the extent we're willing to give it, it'll be a stream, it'll be a river, it'll be a flood, it'll be whatever. But the more we start to give it, as Suzanne so rightly said, Pretty soon you can't stop it. Yeah. You start giving a little here, a little there, and the next thing you know, bang, the yeah. dam breaks, and it just floods. It just goes everywhere. Yeah. That's what God wants to do through each and every one of us. We need to be like the Catholic priest, uh, Brennan. Uh, I read a few of his books as well. This guy's a mess. He's a Catholic priest. Left the priesthood, got married, got divorced, went back to the priesthood. He was an alcoholic. He was all messed up all of his life. And he's written some of the most beautiful books on grace. Why? Because he needed it. Because he lived it. And he had some of the, the, the greatest impact on people's lives 
who saw themselves as failures, who saw themselves as unloved, who saw themselves as somebody God could never deal with. And because of this guy's honesty, I'm not endorsing what he did. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that was a good thing. I'm saying he made something positive out of uh, otherwise wasted, what we yeah. would say is a wasted life. Yeah. How did he do it? By just simply extending grace to people who he knew needed it yeah. as desperately as he did. Amen. We can do it. Every one of us can do that. Yeah. Every one of us have people that we interact with on a regular basis, people that we come into contact with all the time, and we see them as hateful, we see them as confrontational, we see them as belligerent, we see them as just stubborn, you know, rigid in their sin and their behavior and everything else, when in fact, if we look past and see the choices that they're making, there's a reason for those choices, and those choices are there's a thirst that cannot be met by anyone but Jesus. And the only way Jesus is going to meet that need is through you. Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. You're not going to see any more of the Father except me. And I'm telling you, in this world, until the end, the only God they're going to see is you and me. The only revelation, the only light, the only manifestation is us. That's it, period. They may get a vision, somebody may get a dream somewhere else, but I'm telling you, as far as hands-on, as far as interaction, as far as expressing God, the only way it's going to happen is us. We are the body of Christ. It's time we just realize that that's yeah. what he's telling us. And greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. Amen? Amen. Say praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a great week. Stay warm. Let the water flow. Praise the Lord.